here's what I want to do. This is where we started last week. What I'm going to do this week, as I started last week, is I want to give you the theological distinctives of our corner of Christianity that never seems to get discussed by atheists and agnostics. When I hear atheists talk, <laughs> just breaking the whole thing here today. When I hear atheists talk and they describe the God that they don't believe in, you know what I usually say? Well, that's good because I don't believe in that God either. And that's not the God is revealed in the Bible. So what, what I want to do before we start deconstructing the arguments of atheists and agnostics, which we're probably going to do next week, I want to make sure everybody knows what we believe as Christians. And so I put up this list last week, and I'm going to modify it, so don't get too attached to this one. But one of the main things I think we need to teach people about how we perceive Christianity is, number one, God doesn't think like men, but mankind seems to respect the characters we call godliness. Anytime you're talking with somebody who doesn't believe, on some level they think what they believe is smarter than God or is more moral than God. Have you ever had somebody say, I can't believe the Bible would say dot, dot, dot is a sin. I can't believe God would say dot, 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 hello? Well, on some level you're saying, I'm smarter than God as revealed in the Bible, or I am more moral than Jesus, right? But here's the interesting thing. All the traits that we call godly, human beings love. We love people who are generous, correct? We love people who are self-sacrificing. We honor them. We build statues to people who are self-sacrificing. We love people who are honest. We love people who have courage. Well, these are all godly traits that are exemplified in Jesus. Second thing is, and this is just about, this is the second most important point. All powerful means all resourceful, not all controlling. Have you heard this one enough that it rings in your brain? You go, I've heard Sean say that many times before. Yes? Okay. This is the one atheists and agnostics don't seem to get. They seem to think that if God is all, is all powerful, it means he has to be all controlling. Why? Because humans are. And think about this for a second, folks. When is all controlling a good thing? Is an all controlling government a good thing? We call it fascist, fascism. We call it statism. We call it a rogue state. We call it a dictatorship. Has, is that ever used in a good sense? Kim Jong-un is all-powerful and trying to be all-controlling. Is he an admirable person? ISIS wants to create a caliphate where they would be all-powerful and all-controlling. Is this something we are looking forward to? No. God is behind this idea of giving every human being free rights to choose, which means you can choose him or you can reject him because that is loving. Correct? If you can only get two points across to someone who's an atheist or agnostic, make sure this is number two. All powerful means God is all resourceful, not all controlling. Uh, number three, God's will is only done by those agreeing with him. So when somebody would, would call a flood an act of God, no, a flood is not an act of God. The act of God is people risking their lives to rescue. When the two planes went into the trade center, that is not the will of God. The will of God is for people to run up to rescue those people who are trapped. You've heard this one enough that you get it, correct? Okay, number three, uh, number four, death rules this planet. This is one that a lot of people aren't going to get. Our corner of Christianity believes that for this period of time, Satan and death have the upper hand. Jesus dying on the cross and rising again started the revolution to where those of us who have Jesus inside of us now start to overthrow Satan and his plans for mankind. And I'm going to go into that a little further in the future. Uh, number five, free will runs this planet. So death might rule the planet, but free will runs this planet. Both love and evil require free will and consequences. This planet has to have the consequences of free will for free will to truly be free. 
If I, give, if I gave Zachary when he was two years old a dollar, drove him to 7-Eleven, had him pick out a Snickers bar, handed the dollar that I handed him over to the person so that I could eat the Snickers bar, is he acting in free will? No. And there are corners of Christianity that say God has to control everything or he can't control anything. And that's not the biblical picture. The whole Bible is God saying, if you obey me, you're going to have a great time on this planet. And you're going to have an even better time in heaven. And the whole Bible, his people saying, nye, 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 to God, <laughs> doing their own thing. And God saying, I don't want to punish you. But your choices are creating an evil outcome. The whole Bible. Jesus, just before he dies, looks over at Jerusalem. And remember, Jesus is God. And he says, Oh, Jerusalem, I wanted to gather you like a hen gathers its chicks to protect and nurture, but you refused. Does that make sense? All right. By the way, would you, would you do me a favor? You guys are smart, so you're probably not going to have many. But one through six, are any of these not clear? And don't be afraid if you were to say, you know what, number four, number five isn't very clear. Because I want to make sure we get these. Because the eternal destiny of your friends and family members hangs on our ability to have the confidence to jump into tough conversations. Is that fair? All right, let's keep going. So here's the second half of the list. God values eternity over emotional immediacy. The whole reason Jesus comes to earth is because he believes in a place called hell. Do you know Jesus talked about hell more than heaven? And I know it's gotten out of fashion for Christians to talk about hell. And I got called a heretic over it last week. But Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. By the way, this is a perfect time to mention it. Out on the uh, cabinet, out on the shelf, last Tuesday... I spent over an hour talking about the different perspectives of hell that Christians believe. And I recorded Tuesday night, and I have it out there for you. Now, I'm going to say this very, very importantly. Those CDs will not be out there for long. Because last week's little kerfuffle was over the concept of hell, I wanted to clarify it. So there's almost an hour talking about the, what Jesus teaches about hell and the different ways it applies. And it's right out there. Grab the CD as you go. They're not going to be here next week. This isn't something I just want out in general. This is going to be just for us to grab. Is that fair? So grab them on your way out. Hell is created for those who tell God, leave me alone, because at some point he will. Why? Because love requires free will. The moment God overrides somebody's free will is the moment he stops being loving. Uh, number eight, this is the most important one, and this is what we're going to talk about the rest of the time. Jesus, not the Old Testament, is the perfect final picture of God. I'm going to go into that in a minute. Number nine, Christianity is choosing to agree with Jesus. If somebody says, I can't believe Christians would do this, you have the perfect opportunity to say, if Jesus would do it, it's Christian. If Jesus wouldn't do it, it's not Christian. I can complicate a lot of things. That one I can't complicate. Uh, number 10, everyone is a disciple. Only choosing to be Jesus's makes you a Christian. Everybody is being discipled by something. Right now. You are all the, a disciple of, of whatever you've chosen to be a disciple of. And not choosing Jesus is to choose your own reasoning. Every human being will eventually say, how great is our God or how great is my brain? And I don't know about you, my brain has been behind me for every bad decision I've ever made. Is a lot of this sounding repetitive? Please say yes. Because I want you to be able to say this. We're not here for religious theater. I'm not, we're not here to entertain you. We're here to prepare you to walk into your world Amen. and have the confidence when someone comes in and says, I don't believe there's a God, for you to be able to say, let's talk about this. Let me clarify what the Bible says. 
I've never heard atheists bash any of these points. Because most, a most atheists believe in a picture of God that is not supported by the Bible. All right, let's keep going. Uh, theological distinctive number 11, God will eliminate all evil for all eternity. God is not your Superman. God is not a superhero who's going in and punishing bad guys and rewarding good guys every time something happens. God will move supernaturally, but he only does it according to his kingdom, his will, his timing. Most people want God to be their own private Superman. Right? As long as they punish the bad guys, they don't see the bad that's in my heart. <laughs> Let me... All right, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to come back to the Lazarus story at the end. So, everybody look over here. Don't look over there yet. Look over here. I rewrote some of these this week. A lot of the same concepts, but I think I rewrote them in ways that are easier to, to comprehend. So, we're just going to go through a few of these again. Number one, as you saw, and, and these are now in order of importance. Okay. I think the most important thing you can tell someone who doesn't believe, especially someone who's an atheist or an agnostic, is God doesn't think like man. God values character over comfort. Would you agree that humans value comfort over character? Yes. God values eternity over right now. And friends, this is where your feelings come in. Every human being on the planet has said, God, I want to feel better right now. But he will not be your drug. He wants you to learn to function better more than just merely feel better. Does that make sense? Yes. He wants you to learn how to systematically go back to him so that you go from just happiness to joy. Amen. If you pursue happiness, it is a guarantee you will never be happy. But if you pursue joy through Christ's likeness, you become undefeatable. Right? Right? Because you know everything's working together for my good because I love God and called according to his purpose. Number three, God values knowing over feeling. Our society right now values feeling far more important than knowing what's true. Would you agree? And that's why I have to say half a dozen times every week, the loudest voice in your head is never God. Because the loudest voice in your head is usually saying, make me feel better. Now, it should be easy. <laughs> what is it? Easy, now, and more. And I should have more happiness than I have right now. Right? All right, here's the part I want to spend a little time on today. This is just about the most important thing you can tell somebody who doesn't believe. Whether they're Christian, or I'm sorry, whether they're non-Christian, whether they're atheist or agnostic. Jesus is the fullest and the final expression of God. Do you want to know what God is like? Don't look at the Old Testament only. We're not Jewish. Does that make sense? So many people get hung up on the pictures of God in the Old Testament. The pictures of God in the Old Testament, what are they? Who, who's heard me say this a hundred times before? The pictures of God in the Old Testament are puzzle pieces. Okay, one at a time. Here a little, there a little. The final picture of God is Jesus on the cross. Showing you, this is what love looks like. It's self-sacrificial. And here's just the ones I pulled out of the top of my head on Thursday afternoon. In John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, God, the word was with God, and the Word was was God. John is using the phrase in the beginning. Do you think Jewish people understand the concept of in the beginning? <laughs> yeah. He's intentionally doing it. He's intentionally poking them in the eye. In the beginning was Jesus. And he created the world. And then in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Do you want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. John chapter 5, Jesus says to the scribes and the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think inside of them are life. Now think about this for a second. Put, put your Old Testament hat on. 
He's talking to Old Testament scribes and Pharisees who spent their whole life studying the law of God. And Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you believe in them our life. And you know what the Pharisees said? Finally, something Jesus and us agree with. Right? And then what does Jesus say? The scriptures are talking about me. Can you believe the gall to say that if it's not true? You search the scriptures for life? No, they're talking about me. Uh, John chapter 14, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. That's the answer to Philip saying, well, just show us the Father. And he goes, have you been with me this long? Have you not listened to one thing I've said, Philip? Hoy, gavalt. <laughs> if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If your friends and family members are saying, I, I can't imagine a God that would flood the whole earth and kill everybody, you can say, well, guess, well, understand something. Jesus is the fullest expression of God. We don't interpret Jesus through the Old Testament. We interpret the Old Testament through Jesus. Jesus. Uh, Matthew chapter 11 and, verse, and Luke chapter 10. Jesus says, no one knows the Father but the Son and to whom he reveals it. Can you imagine Jesus saying this to the scribes and Pharisees, saying, Moses didn't know the Father. David didn't know the Father. Isaiah, Hosea, Jeremiah, they didn't really know the Father. No one knows the Father but the Son. See the size of that statement? A Mount of Transfiguration. They go up to the top of the hill. Moses and Elijah show up. What does Peter say? Whoa, Moses and Elijah, let's build some tents. Let's stay here. <laughs> and Peter was so wrong, God had to shout from heaven to get his attention. How many of you know you're having a bad day when God's got to correct you in public? Huh? <laughs> Listen to him only. Did you get the size of that? Uh, in the book of John, there are eight times when Jesus says, I am. And he says it where he butchers the Greek. So it's basically, I am that I is. He's trying, I believe he's trying to replicate when God was in the burning bush and he said, tell me your name. And he says, tell him I am that I am. Jesus takes the name that you can't even say out loud, and he says, that's me. I am that I am the bread of life. I am that I am the good shepherd. When he walks out on the water and they're terrified, he says, don't be afraid. I am that I am. If Jesus wasn't God, he should have been crucified for blasphemy. And then ultimately in John chapter 8, he's arguing with the scribes and the Pharisees. And he's saying, you're just like your father, the devil. They go, we have no father but Moses. And Jesus said, before Moses, no, wait, before Abraham, Yahweh, I am that I am. And the proof that they knew what he was talking about is they ripped their garments because they were in the presence of blasphemy. It's one thing if one of Jesus' followers says Jesus is God, but when Jesus' enemies rip their garments because they know he just said he was God. That, to me, almost says more than his disciples saying it. Right? Uh, Hebrews chapter 1. Okay. See, in past times and past ways, God spoke through our fathers through various methods. But in this day, he has spoken through his son, who is the radiance. The, this light radiates. Light. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. What does the Bible say? I will share my glory with no one. Barnabas in Hebrew says, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. The exact representation of his nature. Paul in Colossians chapter 1 says, Jesus is the image, the, the seen, the tangible expression of an invisible God. It says, 
God was pleased to make all fullness to dwell in him. I can't overstate this, friends. And you're going to hear me talk about this more in coming weeks. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. And if you have, and again, when you're talking with someone who's an atheist and or agnostic, the point is not to out argue them. Because if you argue them in, someone can argue them out. You just want to create enough of an opening and enough doubt for Jesus to come and work. Amen. Someone says, I can't believe in a God that would order that the Israelites would kill every man, woman, child, and animal in a country. You say, well, I hear that and I understand the conflict. But if you really want to understand Christianity, Christianity is all about Jesus. And the Bible clearly says Jesus is the final, fullest expression of God. People can argue against Christianity. They can argue against the Bible. They have a hard time arguing against Jesus. Right? And if you just keep coming back, I believe you're opening big doors. All right, is that helpful? So here's, here's the next one. All powerful means all resourceful, not all controlling. I've modified this next one. Death and Satan temporarily rule this planet. God will punish all evil for all eternity. Hell is the final encapsulation of evil. But for right now, we got a battle on our hands. Is this one clear? Okay, because I, I can't tell you how many people have walked away from Christianity because they don't understand the problem of evil. And I read so many atheists who have no problem completely bashing God. But you know what none of them ever bring up? Satan. And I am completely convinced. Satan's number one goal is just to get people to believe he doesn't exist. By the way, C.S. Lewis said it too, but you know, what does he know? He's not a heretic. Um, <laughs> the best part about that guy yelling last week is now I've got a joke for 10 years. <laughs> but um, listen, 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 listen. If you get nothing else today, get this. The reason it's so important for Satan, for people to believe he doesn't exist or believe he's a fiction of somebody's imagination or he's just a bit player. Because there are Christians who believe, yes, there's a devil, but, but God has him on a leash. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, so this leash allows Auschwitz and this leash allows Darfur. This leash allows Stalin to systematically starve a million Czechoslovakia? That's the leash? See, if, if, if Satan gets us to not believe in the activity of Satan, people can only blame God. Right? There's no other choice. And if people believe all-powerful means all-controlling, then of course you're going to believe God. I talk to some people who are Calvinists who are trying to, to blame catastrophes on God. I'm like, what do you need a devil for? If God's doing all this, what's Jesus doing running around healing everybody? You never see Jesus making somebody sick so we can heal them later. He treats everybody like they're in Darfur. They're, they're in the middle of a war. He sets them free. Does that make sense? I've never heard an atheist talk about Satan. Now, can I tell you the weakness in my argument right now? If you're talking with an atheist or agnostic, you need to get them to not only believe there's a God, but you need to believe, in, believe there's Satan. And if you have a hard time believing in God, you're going to have a hard time believing in Satan. But honestly, if I wasn't a Christian, how many kids do I have in here? Okay, you two are smart. You can handle this. If I wasn't a Christian, I'd find it easier to believe in a devil than to believe in a God. If you look at this planet. I, I think so. And you have these Christians running around wanting to believe in angels, but not wanting to believe in demons. Sorry. 
Uh, okay, free will runs the planet. Both God and Satan require human agreement to fulfill their will. Christianity is agreeing with Jesus. Number seven, God will eventually eliminate all evil for all eternity. Hell is for people who tell God, leave me alone. Is, is, the, is this simpler language to kind of track with? Hell is a loving God giving people what they love most. Independence from him. Wow. Yeah, I thought so too. Okay. Now, again, let me also stress. The cartoonish picture of hell being a place where d demons torture people is more Roman Catholic than it is Bible. And I explain the whole thing on the CD. Every picture of hell, Jesus, Paul, Peter, are using the worst words they can think of to describe it. The reason there's confusion is they use different words. And they're the worst words they can think of. But that still doesn't change the fact that it's, it's a different reality than we can understand. And you have to be okay to say to somebody who doesn't believe, you know what, good Christians can, can differ as to what the nature of hell is. Because you can't. And that's what I talk about on that CD. But what you can't defer on and differ on is Jesus believes in hell so much he went to the cross. Okay. Uh, has this been helpful? Yeah. All right. Well, here's the part I didn't quite do. Look at your neighbor while I scroll back and say, do you got a little more brain space? All right. Number, so this is after number 11. Most important thing to, to teach your friends and family members that they misunderstand about Christianity. Number one, all powerful does not mean all controlling. Number two, Jesus is the fullest, final expression of God. Here's something I really want you to be able to explain. It's the Lazarus story. Everyone cries at God, some cry to God, those who cry with God see life among death. Really quickly, can anybody here would anybody here be able to explain this right now because they've heard me say it so many times? If you can't, I won't feel too bad. I'm actually exaggerating. You, you think you could explain this? I'm not going to make you try. Just because just I, I want to know. I, I really want to know how you're tracking with this. Because, folks, this is the best thing God has ever given me on the subject. Okay? And it goes back to the Lazarus story. When Lazarus died, both Mary and Martha ran up to Jesus, and what did they say? Say it real, real loud, Vi. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. All right, friends, everybody who has ever walked the planet, and remember something, 96% of people who've ever been born and died lived a hand-to-mouth existence. Okay? I get frustrated when my air conditioning takes five minutes to kick in. It's 105 degrees outside and I'm still warm in my car. <laughs> okay? 96% of the, when God looks at us, just, just so you know, when God looks at us, he sees the fact that we're in the top 2% of the world. Okay? Everyone, everyone who's ever been born has cried at God. If you had been here, if you had done more, I wouldn't suffer like that. And let's just check. Would everybody here honestly say, yeah, I've cried at God like that? I might have done it this week. Okay? We're all equal in this. Okay, parents, your teenager comes to you and says, that's not fair. What do you say? <laughs> Excellent. Well, here's one place where it is. Every human being has said, if you had been here. Some cry to God. Martha says, but Jesus, I know that whatever you ask of God, he's going to do. Health starts when we say, as much as this stinks, as much as I hate this, I'm still going to turn to God. Amen. Okay? Now that's good, but it's not completely there yet. Those who cry with God see life amidst death. Jesus said to Martha, show me where you laid him. Now, folks, 
Jesus knew where Lazarus' grave was because there's a hundred professional mourners doing their thing. Jesus wanted to walk with Martha to the place where she gave up hope. Okay? And what does Jesus do when he walks with her and gets to the place where, he, where she gave up hope? What does he do? He cries with her. Why? Because this planet temporarily is under the rulership of Satan and death. And when we step back from our demand from comfort and we step into a kingdom mindset that says everybody we know is a prisoner of war and God weeps over them and I'm going to weep over them too. All of a sudden, we have agreement. We have alignment. We have intimacy. So the power of God can flow through us. Does that make sense? Amen. If you're in a hospital with somebody, if you get somebody who gives you the call and they say, I just got the pink slip. If you are, are sitting with somebody who's grieving, I, I hope you carry this in your pocket. Because this is the kind of thing that will set people free. We will not be a church that feels disempowered to step in the suffering of our friends and family members. Is that fair to say? I want everybody here to, again, we're not trying to argue with people. We're trying to step in their life, show them that we love them, and walk with them. We can say health and healing start when we realize, like Jesus did, this planet right now is a war zone. And let me give you the example that, that, that God just tapped me on the shoulder with this this morning as I was waking up. Non-believers and atheists and agnostics, I think all believe this planet is neutral. You get what you put into it. And that's fine, because sowing and reaping is the most powerful force on the planet, right? But can I give you a little, or what I think is a little clarification? This planet is a house that's on fire. And when we tell our friends and family members of the hope that we have in Jesus, we're saying, hey, we found the ladder. And not only did we find the ladder, Jesus gave us the firefighting equipment so we can go back into the burning building and wake somebody up who's sleeping. Here's the problem. A lot of people that we try to wake up are angry at us because they were having a nice nap. But it's not neutral. And so this is why people say, I don't know how God... I've heard agnostics say things like, you know, God just didn't prove his point to me. He hasn't shown me enough proof and so I can't quite believe. Okay, that's fine. But here's what you have to understand. The house is still burning. If, if, if the fireman didn't make enough of a case for you to get on the ladder and come down, that's your choice. It's not just this passive, I'm undecided. It's an active rejection of what Jesus did for us. Planes come into the Twin Towers. You're on the very top floor. You didn't see anything. You're having a great lunch. You might not want to leave. Doesn't change the fact the, plane, the, the building's coming down. That's our job as Christians, as to, is, is to say, you know what? Well, here, I have it. To not choose is to choose your own reasoning. And basically, it's to reject what Jesus did for you. I didn't see a plane come into the Twin Towers. Sure, he might have heard a, sh a shake, but I'm at, the t I'm at the top floor restaurant and I'm having a good dinner. And I'm not convinced. Does that make sense? Folks, our church would be a heck of a lot bigger if I didn't tell you the realities of what it takes to really be a disciple. And what it really takes is to do what Jesus did and self-sacrificially love everybody into the kingdom. But can I close with this? The pursuit of happiness is the guarantee you're never going to be happy. Pursuing happiness is about 
being self-ish. Joy, 100%, is about self-sacrifice. This isn't some kind of martyr complex. This is a choice. I choose to self-sacrificially love you. I choose to pour my life into yours so that you get to know how much Jesus loves you. My job is to show you how much Jesus loves you. By the way, I pour myself out into you. That is the only path of joy. It's the only path of joy. It's the only path of joy. And when you learn that, you become undefeatable. Because I'm already dead. What can you do to me? Come to my church for the first time, stand up and call me a heretic? Pfft. Had worse. <laughs> By the way, you guys don't know, but <laughs> as he left the sanctuary, he ran into Lynn, my wife, and he said, don't go in there, that guy's a heretic. And Lynn goes, I know. I've been married to him for 25 years. I think so. I think so. Let's pray. Has this been helpful? All right. Uh, next week, next week we're going to look at some of the specific arguments. And then I'm going to try to, and I am, uh, here I go again. I'm going to give you a defense of why God exists that I think everyone can share. Okay? And it, and it doesn't come out of the Bible. It's purely philosophy. So, for people who don't want to accept the Bible, you say, okay, let's, let's talk on another level. So, Lord, help me. <laughs> Jesus, in your name, we just pray that you give us people to talk with this week. To, to, and really embody the fact that, Jesus, you are the perfect example of God, and we are your representative. So we can say to our friends, do you want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. Do you want to know what Jesus looks like? Look at me. Father, we want to love people like that. We pray all these things in your name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Have a good afternoon, everybody.